Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our new book today, we're going to do Timothy, a pastoral lecture. We've got three of them, First, Second, and Second Timothy, as well as um, Timothy. Three pastoral, uh, we're, we're not going to be doing Timothy, but we will do First and Second uh, Timothy. Uh, Titus we won't do, I should say. What does the word Timothy mean, the name Timothy? It, mean, it means valuable to God or uh, 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 dear to God, one or the other, and Timothy was. Timothy, was, had when he first met Paul, he was a teenager. <clears throat> Paul had passed through. He came back about seven years later, and Timothy is now a grown man. Uh, that is to say, at the age of accountability, certainly and had been well taught by his mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. They were Hellenist, meaning they were Hebrews that uh, believed, that were Greek speakers uh, language-wise, but believed in the Word of God. And certainly Timothy, uh, raised in and uh, taught by his mother and his grandmother, was pretty familiar he was taken with that Word of God. And after seven years when Paul comes back through, um, he, he adopts Timothy, spiritually speaking, as his own child. So, uh, fantastic. This book tells us basically what we should do as Christians, what, what the doctrine should do for us, and how we should behave ourselves and so forth how the law applies in this day, and um, pretty well gives you instructions for the church and the family. <clears throat> Excuse me, having said that, let's take Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now, I want you to grab that title. I mean, what is an apostle? It's a sent one. Now, how was Paul chosen? Acts chapter 9, he was struck down on the road to Damascus. He was an enemy of the church. He was on his way to Damascus to destroy the church, the Christian church, that is. And Christ struck him down, blinded him, and led him told him where to go to find the truth, and blessed him, and so it was that he was chosen. And no doubt chosen in the first earth age, no doubt it was a certainty. And he was to have a threefold ministry in that uh, ninth chapter of Acts, in the 15th verse and 16th, to one, to the kings and queens of the ethnos, that's the Gentiles, and to Israel. And that's why in Paul's letters, you have truth for everyone. So you have to listen on three levels or listen at whatever level is acceptable to you and be happy with it. But uh, here we have um, that one that was sent. Though he was an enemy to the church, he was converted. And what, what does that prove to you that God forgives? Also, God's in control. When he chooses somebody from the first earth age, he knows how to pull their chain here to get them back in line and in service. That's what he did to Paul. And now Paul is, is converting many people, Timothy being one thereof. Verse 2, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, that means spiritually, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord wants that peace to go to him, giving these instructions to um, Timotheus, as it would be in the Greek, or Timothy in our English language, valuable to God, and certainly he was. Verse 3, 
as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest change some that they teach no other doctrine, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This, this, why? Well, there's only one doctrine. It's when people turn away from the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ that they begin to get in trouble, and big trouble at that. Why? Because it's traditions of men that make void the Word of God. Christ, in the simplicity that He taught, when you pull away from that simple message of salvation, then you are really leading yourself astray into the wiles and elements of the world that you can be very entangled within, and they can mislead and, and um, destroy. Verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now, here a lot of people would say, well, then you're not even supposed to think about genealogies. Then you're not a very good reader of, of what is said in the Word, if that's, what, that's your conclusion. Because if we were to destroy genealogies, we would have to do away with a lot of Genesis, with Kings, with Chronicles. Uh, you'd just have to almost take them right out of the Word of God. But well, what did he mean then? Fables. That's false genealogies. That's what you want to look out for. In endless genealogies, meaning going in and making something out of something that isn't there. Otherwise, you stick to facts. It, is, it was never any more important that the lineage of Jesus Christ, if you did not follow His genealogy in the Word of God, you would, you would not know for one thing that um, Mary, father was of Judah, the tribe of Judah, king line, but her mother was a Levite, meaning of the priest line. So in Christ, after the order of Melchizedek, Christ was both Levitical and king line. That means both priest and, priest and king, king of kings, lord of lords, both offices. And genealogy, especially in Luke chapter 3, documents that. That's a genealogy that is supremely important. It certainly isn't a fable, and it certainly isn't endless. Verse 5, <clears throat> Now to the end of the commandment is charity. That's, that's love. Out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. That means that is... Um, Genuine, faith that is genuine, faith in the Almighty God and trusting everything He says to the point that you can trace, well, did God really say it? Well, go back to the manuscripts. Then you have documentation. That's what separates some would-be scholars from some scholars. That's not endless. That's simply being intelligent enough to know this King James written in 1611 is a fantastic Bible, but it was taken from manuscripts that were written back when Paul and Timothy walked the soil. And well, what language? Well, it, well, it was they were Hellenists, so it was in the Greek. Okay, and they could speak. Paul could speak more languages than anyone. He could. He was of that day. He was a Roman born. His father being a citizen of Rome. And certainly he could speak the Roman tongue. The Hebrew tongue he was very familiar with, Aramaic very familiar with, the Greek tongue. He spoke colloquial Greek, street Greek you might call it, and, um, and, and, and could communicate with just about anyone. So uh, how precious it is. But, but what of all the gifts, what comes first? Love. Loving what you're doing. Loving the Lord. What, what does He want from you? He doesn't want your burnt offerings. He wants you to love Him. And in loving Him, you would surely, I mean, if you truly, genuinely love God, you want to really analyze the letter He has sent to you telling you how to be happy, telling you how to be content, telling you how to please Him. You would surely do that, would you not? 
In other words, love brings that forth. Love causes you to be a deeper scholar than, that is to say, deeper in the simplicity in which Christ taught. Verse 6, for from, for which some having uh, severed, uh, served, have, ter have severed, have turned aside unto vain j uh, jangling, uh, swerved aside. Do you know what this jangling is? It's a bunch of ratchet jaws. In other words, people that like to just talk, talk, talk more than what is written. And when, when you change away or swerve from the real true word of God and you, you want to jangle ratchet jaw, I don't know, maybe you've never run across a ratchet jaw in your lifetime. Um, that's somebody that can really talk, but it never makes any sense. And if you ask them to document that in the word of God, they so you must be a non-believer or they'll pass it off something to that light. They will not document it. Why? Because it can't be. So uh, vain jangling is something you want to stay totally away from. And, uh, and so it is. And uh, that is the group that they lose sight of the truth by getting too far off the beaten track. Uh, and, and so it is. Verse 7 desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. In, in other words, um, they, um, they probably don't know the difference between ordinances, statutes, and commandments, and the law itself. They wouldn't know the difference and try to set themselves up as teachers when they could not tell you the ceremonial law that was done away with from the true law of the commandments, which God, Christ himself would say in Matthew, I don't change one jot, not even one little letter of the law. I came to fulfill it, and he is the fulfillment thereof. In becoming our Passover and becoming the very living word walking among us to teach us and to lead us and direct us, you don't want some other um, facts by man desiring to be a teacher and doesn't even know the difference between an ordinance and a law. Let's, let's take an example. What does the commandment say, thou shalt not steal? Uh, if you think that law doesn't exist to this day, you're sadly mistaken. It does. You don't want to try it. You'll, you'll end up in much trouble. But at the same time, as far as um, bloodletting or offering a sacrificed animal, that's a, a blood ritual, ceremonial law, done away with. What? Nailed to the cross. That's an ordinance, not a law. And certainly a teacher that doesn't know the difference between law and ordinances is in a heap of hurt and probably will mislead many people and confuse the issue, whereby uh, it throws a cloud over the very Word of God and can, not, and can cause clarity to darken and um, be false. That is to say, you get so far off the track, you swerve totally out of that path. Verse 8, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. If a man understands the law, and he uses it lawfully, it is good. Well, why is that? Well, it keeps you out of trouble. If you follow the law, you're not going to get in trouble. Unfortunately, none of us are perfect. And sometimes we might even break some of the health laws. Um, and you're going to pay for it when you do, because God writes for a reason. It's good if you do it God's way. You'll be healthier if it's health laws. And if it's the laws which we live by, church laws, uh, community laws, governmental laws, you're going to stay out of trouble as best you can in obeying and doing that that is lawful. You see, many people have the idea that the law is bad. No, it's not. Law is good. It's man that is bad because man breaks those laws. And that, that is where trouble begins. Verse 9 Knowing this, 
that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers, that's somebody that lies in wait for no reason, of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. In other words, the, the law certainly is very much in effect. It wasn't made, if a person that never breaks it doesn't have to worry about the law. And a truer statement can never be made. As long as you obey the law, you've got nothing to worry about, basically. Verse 10, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, any kind of perversion, for men stealers, for liars, that is to say people that enslave people and people that lie for perjured persons and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. You see, that's one of the simplest ways that you can tell whether a law, is, whether you're following the law, is it sound doctrine? Does it apply to God's doctrine? Does it apply to Christ's doctrine? That is to say, His message. And certainly, if it is sound, and if it obeys the law, you're not going to have to worry about any of those things forementioned, because it is, the law does not apply to you, it applies to them. It lets them know beforehand God intends, man will probably through law make you pay part of it, but God intends for you to know, let it be a marker. He's going to make you pay for it. Why? Well, you broke His law. And He sits on the throne. He's in charge. What do you think He's going to do? So therefore, there better be a lot of repentance and a, a lot of going to that throne in prayer and asking God's forgiveness when you fall short and ask His blessings instead. Because one of the greatest gifts, as he said, coming out the gate is charity. That's love. Letting God know how much you love Him, how you love His Word. And uh, unfortunately, in the flesh, we mess up sometimes. But that's, that's what the law is for, is to help us get back on track. And our Father is a very forgiving God whenever you are genuinely apologetic and have a change of heart. Verse 11. To continue, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Paul, how was it committed to Paul's trust? On the road to Damascus. I mean, he, Paul's own desire was to destroy the church. But God took, uh, he, God didn't give him a choice. He struck him down and forced him, so to speak, to follow God's Word. And you might say, well, well, I didn't know God would do that. Well, then you don't understand the first earth age. Paul earned the right to be one of God's chosen vessels, as Acts chapter 9, 15 stipulates. He was a chosen vessel for God to use as God saw fit. And so God did use him. Why? He knew from the first earth age, Paul was very zealous. He didn't, he didn't go at something halfway. When Paul undertook a thing, it was all out, and God knew it. That was the same way it was in the first earth age when God chose him. So when God committed the word to the trust in Paul's trust, it couldn't have been in better hands. You see, Paul, don't underrate Paul. Paul was one of the better scholars. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest scholars of that day. He, he knew the Old Testament inside and out. He was very informed. He just missed the point that Christ came of Mary and died on the cross. He missed that. But God had a way of catching him up with it. And so it was that he was, uh, had all this truth committed to him. And he did well. God would utilize him to write a great deal of the New Testament that we so follow. Verse 12, And I think 
<clears throat> I think Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Um, he made me able, is what Paul is saying. Again, you have to realize uh, anybody that does not understand predestination should take the life of Paul and look at it real close. Knowing what Paul's will was, but what God's will was. God's going to have it his way, but he will not, absolutely not, interfere in the life of a person <clears throat> that was not chosen in the first earth age. As we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Behold, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age, this eon of time. Why? And you were justified as it is written in Romans chapter 8. Why? God can move your life around. Why? Because you're already justified. You'll pay for your sin, but you're, you're justified. And he can interfere in your life and move you like he did Paul. But somebody that has free will, meaning they didn't overcome in the first age, God, unless they ask him to do a thing, he will not touch them. Why? Because on judgment day, they will throw it up to him saying, well, if you hadn't interfered in my life. So he will not interfere in someone's life with free will unless you ask. But God wants you to ask. Why? Because he loves you. Charity, love, is the greatest of all. Uh, the, the, the scripture that pops into my mind here for the one with free will that might think they've missed something, they haven't. God loves them. They just didn't cut it in the first earth age. Make sure you don't miss it in this one. But it was, um, would be Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, where God said, Hey, remind me of my promises so we can talk about it um, and I can justify you. That means I can help you and make it right. So whether you have free will or not, you've got to talk to him. You have to remind him. And with free will, that's the way you get his attention because he's not going to interfere in your life otherwise. I'm talking about election, he will interfere in their lives. Free will, he will not. Does he love one more than the other? Absolutely not. He's not a respecter of persons. And those that overcame in the first earth age are his servants. All they do is work for him to try to bring in line those with free will that they have eternal life. Verse 13, to continue who was before a blasphemer, and this Paul coming down on himself, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He said, I, I didn't know Christ had died on the cross. I didn't know he was born that virgin, of that virgin Mary. Though he was familiar with the scripture, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where it stipulates very clearly, a virgin shall conceive and have a child, man child, and you will name him Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. Paul knew that. He said, I missed it. I should have known, but he didn't. But uh, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, so he wasn't accountable. God didn't hold that against him. That's that many times you do things, you young people that do things ignorantly, you young adults that do things ignorantly, it is forgivable, though you may think it isn't. If you do it in ignorance, it is forgivable. And, and you want to love God for that. Charity, love, is the greatest of all gifts. So what you do in unbelief, in ignorance, is forgivable. Verse 14, I mean, let's say it again. Paul, I mean, he was a bad character. He was, I mean, he, he, the church was afraid of him. That's why he had such a hard time working himself back into the church that, hey, he's the one that about ruined us. I mean, he, he was there when they stoned Stephen to death, holding the coats. And Stephen was so righteous. Verse 14, 
and the grace, that's the unmerited favor, the love of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And when, he loved me. Naturally, you of God's elect must know this ties into the first earth age as well. 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I, I'm the worst one. In these three books that I mentioned, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, Five times you will have this saying, this is a faithful saying. Five, of course, means grace. It is utilized five times. That is the purpose. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, he said. In flesh we all fall short. And Paul, he really persecuted the church. He, he wasn't putting on uh, lightly. He, he was severe with it. He had a letter in his pocket with permission from the chief Pharisees to destroy the church in Damascus, in Syria, and intended to do it until God stopped him, turned him around, and made a servant out of him. Verse 16, Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And, um, and what, what you may think that you are undeserving. But think of Paul, who persecuted. If anyone was undeserving, he would have been. God changed his heart, his mind, and that servant came forth. Again, elect understand this. Some may have trouble with it. It's um, you have to understand the ages. Verse 17, now unto the king eternal. That means through the king throughout all ages, the first, this one, and the one to come. Immortal, immortal invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, that's the way it is. He's saying that. Giving, paying homage to our Heavenly Father for having straightened Him out, for having given Him the message of salvation. For who? For sinners. Why? God loves all of His children. Do you know what the duty of elect are? It's to do the bidding of Christ, and His bidding is to save sinners. To teach truth in a simple way, not making some great name for yourself, but making a name called the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that He, and in believing upon Him, can bring you eternal life. Not, not some pit with fiery brimstone, that is uh, God the consuming fire, but give you peace, a perfect world with the firmament back in the place it should be. No storms, a perfect earth rejuvenated as it is written in Revelation 21. Rejuvenated back to its original form whereby you can have eternal life there. God wants you to participate in bringing and practicing that salvation. You know, you can take a little light and say, it's mine, mine, mine. I see that and I know I'm better than anyone. No, you're not better than anyone else. God is not a respecter of person. And if you want charity to move away from you, just have that attitude. Boy, it'll, God will drop you like a hot rock. Love overcomes all. This is not to say that you're not to be cautious and you're not to practice that against our enemy, but to save as many as you can in being fair and equitable in bringing forth the Word of God, whereby the price is paid on the cross that they can participate in. That's a true saying. Verse 19 to continue, 18 rather, to continue. This charge, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, his spiritual son, 
according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by then mightest war a good warfare against the wicked, against the evil, that you are brilliant enough that you can, you, what is the most powerful weapon in the world? The Word of God. It's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It can take the highest office in the land and cut him right down to smithereens. That is to say, spiritually speaking, when wrong is done or when right is done to build them up, to be fair, to be equitable. Verse 19, holding faith. Now, now what, what is faith? With the gospel armor, I want you to think about it. It's your shield. And a good conscience, um, that's the breastplate. Have that right out in front of you. Which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And, and naturally, with um, Christ being that shield, you, and faith in Him, you put Him away, you're, gonna, you're going on the rocks, friend. You're sailing your little old ship right out into bad, bad country. And there's reefs and rocks aplenty. Christ protects and Christ avoids shipwreck of your life and pulls you back together, gives you hope because you have faith in Him and a clear conscience know you're doing the best you can. Verse 20 to complete the chapter. Of whom is Hymenaeus and uh, Alexander? They denied the resurrection there was any life after death, whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. In other words, I've turned them over to the devil. He can beat them up till maybe they'll come around. And that's what can happen to you. You let Satan get a hold of one of God's elect when they pull away. He will chew them up right real good. Why? He's got everybody else. And when, when you... Stop casting your pearls before swine and just let them go to the devil. He can chew them up enough that they'll come right on back saying, help me, help me, help me. Uh, Satan doesn't waste any time doing it. He knows God's elect. Why? He stood against them in the first earth age. He's got to do it again. Why did God choose them as the election? Because he knows they'll stand against Satan. It's, they, they, they abhor him. They do not find him tempting. They find him to be an abomination. And God knows that. And he can, he'll love you for that. That's what the war is about. Is those that would go against truth. That would take those freedoms away from us. That's worth fighting for, my friend. That's what warfare is. All right. First Timothy, how we should react. How a Christian should act. You've got it. First lecture, don't miss the next one. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, <clears throat> please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. 
You know why you don't have to? God does. He is the judge. He doesn't want you doing it. He wants you to practice spiritual discernment. That is a gift from God. Always use it. Uh, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, prayer request, you got one? Don't need the phone number? You don't need an address. Why? Charity, God loves you and he knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. No one can ever prevent you from praying because they won't know when you are praying. Let him know you love him. Won't you do that, Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to go to Flora from West Virginia. Please explain the gulf in paradise and where it is found in the Bible. It's found in Luke chapter 16. It has to do, quite simply, with the fact Jesus using a parable of two men, the actual men on earth, but then making a parable from it, that, um, that the book of life that is kept on you, right in heaven, no church can ever keep your letter. It doesn't, the church that you have at some letter is, is uh, not going to do you one iota of good in heaven. Why? Because your record is there. It's called the Book of Life. That's your church record. <clears throat> and um, it determines instantly when you arrive there which side of that gulf you go on. So um, that's why it's so important when you repent. When you fall short, you better repent. It erases from the Book of Life that that is bad, and God doesn't even want to hear about it again. And naturally, the good is always locked right there, okay? But you'll find it there in Luke 16 concerning Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, Rowena from Oregon. Pastor Murray, where is it written <clears throat> that good deeds cover a multitude of sins? And like what kind of deeds and sins? Well, it's chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And, and it is that um, good works, that, and good works is many things. It's, it is um, things that you might do to, what, what was the good purpose of Christ to convert sinners? It is the life you set is a living example of a Christian. That's why Timothy is so important. Let's a Christian know how to live. And, and um, when, when you do something good, it, it helps cover sin. You, you know, there's something else that in that same fourth chapter in the 17th verse, it says that judgment starts at the pulpit. In other words, it starts with Christians. Judgment starts with Christians. It starts with preachers first. And um, in first, uh, first Peter chapter 4 verse uh, 17, I'll give that to you, same chapter. And uh, it lets you know God holds us accountable <clears throat> but love overcomes all. Okay, um, Georgetta from Virginia. Okay, thank you for your... Um, bless you. Thank you, my Georgetta from Virginia. Here is my question. Um, when you speak of the earth ages, I'm a little confused. Does Noah's time in the first... Is it in the first earth age? And if so, please explain the first, second, and third earths. So what happens to the first? Noah's flood was not in the first earth age. It was in this earth age. The flood that happened in the first earth age, Noah's was just a little wet rain compared to it. It was called the katabo. I mean, that's what broke up the plates of this earth. <clears throat> That's what brought the firmament down from the heavens. That's why we today have a jet stream. Instead of having the firmament up where we have perfect weather from North Pole to South Pole. And um, that was the Ketubo. If you have a companion Bible, make a note of Appendix 146. It'll teach you more about that first earth age uh, 
the overthrow than you might have wanted to know even. But that was the first earth age. God had a choice. A third of his children had already followed Satan. Went, I mean, went right with him. And God had a choice. He could destroy a third of his children. You ever thought about having to kill a third of your children? That's a pretty tough cookie. God didn't want to do it. So instead, he destroyed the first earth age. And God must give some his children free will to attain what? Love. You cannot order love. You can't demand it. You can't buy it. It's got to come from each ent entity. Therefore, God has to let his children be free and make a choice. So he destroyed that earth age, brought them in, born of woman in this one, innocent babe to make his or her mind up, you're going to love God or you're going to love Satan. It's, and then the third earth age is the coming. You can read of all three of them in 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me, Kathy from Colorado. I keep getting letters from so-called prophets who are writing weekly asking for money, telling me I must answer back and send certain amounts of money that miracles and when my prayer is answered. You know, there, this, let's just take a short. God does not send out beggars. Okay. If somebody writes you a letter begging for money, they're not from God. Okay. I'm just making friends and influencing people here, all right? But God, as it is written, will not send out a beggar. If you have to beg to stay on television, if you have to beg to keep your church open, you're, you're probably not pleasing God. I'm not going to say you're a fraud, but anybody that go, writes to senior citizens especially and tells them they need to have their prayers answered or buy their ticket is a liar and is straight out of the pits of Satan. Okay, now I will say that and I don't mind saying it. And I'm not judging, that's just a fact. God does not send out beggars. So take those little old letters, and if it has a return postage guaranteed, put not interested and, and drop it back in and make him pay the postage back on it. Okay, you'll probably stop receiving them. <clears throat> you can tell him I said so if you want to. Ronnie from Kentucky. My mom believes that your soul never dies and that you burn forever in hell if you go there. Is this right? Well, um, where can I find it in the Bible? I believe you go up like fat hitting the fire and die the second death. You are correct, Ronnie. There is a parable, an acrostic in the 37th Psalm that documents exactly what you're saying. If you have a companion Bible, in the 37th chapter, it lights, it, it um, goes into the Hebrew and instructs you on how that acrostic works. And that's exactly what it says. The, the question was asked, why is it that it seems like that the, the, the rich are, are never punished? And Father said, you know what? They're going to be like the lamb roasting on a spit over an open fire, like the fat that drops into the fire and the smoke goes up forever. And the last leg of that uh, acrostic is that you're going to be there to see it. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to read Revelation chapter 20, the last two verses, which is the second death. And, and the first verse of, in other words, they go into this lake. And then the very first verse of chapter 21 of Revelation says, there's going to be a new earth. And the, the Greek is very specific. It is rejuvenate this earth. Same earth, third, third earth age. Going to rejuvenate it, and there won't be any lakes of water. So what does that mean? It means those in the pit are gone. They're blotted out. As a matter of fact, we won't even remember them. When you blot something out, it is gone. That's why heaven will be complete. There won't be any sadness. You see, there are certain ministries that would like you to believe. We're going to go to heaven and here's the throne of God and we're all gathered around just holding each other's hands and right there, there is a fire burning and we can watch those sinners suffer forever. I mean, they're crying and they're screaming and they're yelling and we're in heaven. 
that doesn't sound like heaven that God's Bible talks about, His Word, His letter. He says, I'm going to blot them out. You won't even remember them. That's why you can read in 21, there won't be a tear shed because you won't remember those that didn't make it. Mike from Michigan. My question is, why do we say amen after prayers? My, and sometimes say amen and amen saying it twice. Revelation 3.14 refers to the amen. Can you please explain? It, it's really very simple. This is why you want to have a strong concordance. Okay. Check it out in any language. You know, you've got amen sections in a lot of churches. They sit back, amen, amen. Do, do they really know what they're saying? All amen means is, that's that. I mean, it'll give you a teaching, and then, then God saying is, amen, it's, that's that. Meaning, take it or leave it, like it or lump it. That's the word of God, and that's the way it is. I wonder how many of those amen sections in these churches realize what they're really saying. I, I, you know, they'll sit back, cross their legs, kick their foot, amen, amen. That's that, that's that. That's what they're saying, okay? Um, it sounds like I'm picking on people today. I don't really mean to, but um, that's what it means. Martha from Tennessee. I have a question. I understand why people with ill-gotten gains prosper, but why do Christians that support the rapture and other false religions prosper? Martha, not everybody that claims to be Christian is. You know, Satan's coming very soon. His message is, I've come to fly you away. Guess how many are going to jump on his wagon? Do you call those Christians? Um, and God has sent a letter that Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and Luke 21, there's no way that you're going to gather back to Christ until the Antichrist comes first. And, um, and certainly... Not everybody that claims to be a Christian is. So that's the answer to your question. Jim from Vermont. Pastor, what do you mean when you said Job's friends were not of Abraham's seed, but Adam's seed? They were of Esau. Esau and Jacob were twins and born of the Adamic line. Can you help me out on this? Uh, thank you, Pastor. Your help you will find in Genesis chapter 26, verse 34. To know why um, I would say that um, Job's friends were not of Adamic seed. Because you will find out that Esau had two wives. They were both Hittites. So what do you think their offspring was? Um, Pat Patricia from Wisconsin. In Deuteronomy 17, 16, three times a year, we shall appear before the Lord. First of the un Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Passover, Feast of the Weeks, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, Christ's Birthday. What I need to know is how do we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles if you can't afford to go to the chapel? Well, you do it at home. What what is our what, what does the Feast of Tabernacles consist of today? Both Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles is simply to celebrate Passover, to call it to mind what happened there, that Christ died for our sins, and His blood causes evil to have to pass over you. So. How do we do that today? By his instructions that he left until he retakes again that table of the Lord with us anew. We take the actual body of Christ, the bread, which took the stripes and we get the healing. And you take the cup, which washes away your sins and the sins of the world that participate and that believe. And, and shows that's how you celebrate Passover at home. You can either take it with us or you can, you can take that table on your own. It's fine. Um, God will, not, will honor it, respect it, and that's your love for Him. Travis from Ohio. 
Is repentance a, a feeling or a notion? Well, well, repentance has two parts. Repentance is to be sorry for what you have done, that is repent, but to have also a change of heart. That is to say, to know you did wrong and you're, as best you can, not going to do it again. And you ask for forgiveness. And if you're sincere, he'll give it to you. William from Michigan. When I pass on and if I acquire into heaven, will I be once more with the wife that I've had? Thank you. Well, you'll know her as it is written in Ezekiel chapter uh, 44, which is the millennium. From Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end, it's all in the millennium. It stipulates that you will know your wife, your husband, your sons, and your daughters, that you will recognize them. Loretta from Georgia, I know God protects us spiritually, but does he also protect us physically? Can you give me the scriptures, please? The 13th chapter of Luke probably would be the best scripture for you to read. Did those um, that were butchered have more faith or more sin than anyone else? And the answer is no. And the Tower of Siloam that fell and killed 18 people, were they bigger sinners than anyone else? No, they were just in the wrong place at the right time. So um, God did not prevent that. So accidents happen. Now, God, I believe, if it is a person who God has on a mission, and if it is a person, there are times God will intercede. And he, it possibly will be spiritual, maybe to give you a split-second warning in time for you to take evasive action to prevent an accident. And um, I, I know that when you fight for a Christian reason, I know that um, many wonderful things happen and many awful things happen on battlefields. But um, Father is in charge and Father's in control. And just as he led Paul, sometimes he leads people and sometimes accidents happen. I think Luke 13 will help you. Don't put yourself in bondage. That's what 18 means, and that's why 18 is utilized there. Harold from Tennessee. I have a friend, and when we communicate on the telephone, he always says, God bless you, and I always say, have a good day, because he is a rapture believer. Am I wrong in doing this? No, you you know, he, he, he lo probably loves the Lord, and the, the second epistle of St. John says, if you as much as wish God speed, that means if you support a group that you know is teaching wrong, you then become a partaker of their evil deeds. So God has a way of putting convictions on people. And um, if you have no conviction from it, I would say you're in real good shape. You don't have to worry about it, okay? Letitia from Florida. Are the angels in their spiritual bodies and are they male, female? Please explain. They are as the angels and when you pass on, you go into the body of the third earth age. Not the first, not the second. I'm talking about angelic bodies. They change just like the flesh bodies have. Um, Michael from Oklahoma. We're going to keep up the good work. I like the program. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. My question is, why was Paul in jail? What was Paul in jail for? Thank you, and God bless you and your staff. Well, Paul was in jail for teaching the Word of God. He was not in jail for stealing, for robbing, or anything other than teaching the Word of God. Because... Uh, he was very high up in the, he was a Pharisee. And there was much jealousy on that. They, they were out to get him. When he, were, he converted, I mean, there was 40, let, I'm going by memory now, it seemed like it was 40 or 42 made a vow they were going to die or kill Paul. So they, they wanted him real bad. That's the way Satan operates. So he was in jail for teaching God's word. And um, that's, that, is, that is no sin. 
Uh, Joyce from um, Tennessee, you have helped me learn so much. Thank you. My question is, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, does it literally mean that you pluck out your eye or cut off your arm? Please answer. I'm really confused. God does not want you to harm the body he created. But you see, we in the end times especially are the many-membered body. And if you have, in other words, the groups everywhere make up that body. But if you have a body off over here that starts teaching falsely and, and um, not going by the word of God, <clears throat> by a bunch of ratchet join, or not teaching truth, you cut yourself away from them because it's better to cut away from that group than it is for the whole body to burn in hell, okay? So you have to protect truth and common sense. That's the love of God saying, do you love me enough to believe my word or not, okay? And I'm out of time, okay. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes His day. When you read the letter, it's a love, love letter that He sent to you. And when you study that, it makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. That that's, is charity. That's love for God and the Word He sent. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, in your life, in mine, in everyone's, is this. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel. Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.